Good morning. I am not Pastor Joe, if you haven't noticed. Uh, I am Teresa, and I am also not Joe's wife. That is Therese. And um, if you're with us online today, we are so excited that you're with us, and I'm just honored to be here. Joe asked me to teach today, and so, um, so I said yes, and I just want to invite the Lord to come right now and have his way this morning. So, Father, we love you. We thank you for this beautiful day that you have made. And, Lord, I pray that you'd come and show yourself strong in your word this morning. Lord, I pray that you would redeem what the enemy has stolen, that you would strengthen our hearts by your spirit in our inner man, God. And so as we open your word, have full reign in this place. I just want to encourage each person here right now just to say, Lord, I open my heart to you. Have full reign in my heart this morning. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. amen. So uh, my name is Teresa. If, if I don't already know you, I am the 13th of 14 children and um, Catholic family. Since I get the question, Mormon or Catholic? It's Catholic family. <laughs> Uh, my twin sister and I are number 13 and 14, and, um, and I have three children, three grown children. One is about to turn 19, and one is 27, and one's 29. And I think about when I was like a new mom and just holding this tiny little package that I had no idea, you know, what to do with. And little did I know that those sweet little peanuts could, you know, it was like buckle up because... It's a crazy world to raise a child, right? And as I was thinking about it, I, was, um, I like to laugh. And so I was trying to think of some funny moments with each of my kids. And I remember my daughter was, I think she was 18, and she was riding her bike 10 miles to Pete's Coffee down in Newport Beach. And I had told her, she wasn't living with me, and I had told her, I think she was 19, I said, don't ride in the dark. Please don't ride in the dark. And of course, what did she do? She rode in the dark because she had to be at work at like six. So I get a call at 5.30 in the morning and it's mom, I had a head on collision with another bike, I'm okay. So we go to the, find my iPhone and you know, see where she is. And you know, my heart's racing, like at least she's talking, but she didn't sound great. She didn't know where she was, but she was able to call. So by the time we get there, she's in the ambulance and um, she peeks her head around the EMT driver, and she was born in 1993, and she peeks her head around, and she goes, brain damage free since 1993, and I like immediately knew, she's okay, she knows her birthday, she's making a joke, she's going to be all right. Um, it was actually super cool because um, she had her headphones on listening to music, riding in the dark. Um, with the light on, uh, but the guy who she head on with was a big welder dude, and he did not have a light, and they hit head on, and so she was unconscious for about five minutes, and he said, is she an Angels baseball fan? And I'm like, the girl doesn't have an athletic bone in her body, she hates sports. And he goes, oh, that's interesting, because the whole time she was on the ground, she kept saying, the Angels, the Angels. <laughs> and I just know that, you know, God was maybe ministering to her. She did have a concussion, but thank God she was, you know, she was okay. Um, I think about my mom and, you know, with 14 kids, can you even imagine that? <laughs> can't even imagine it, and I was part of it. Um, she, I remember my brothers, some of my brothers were a little more difficult than others, and one in particular, like at this moment that I'm remembering, had been expelled from school. And I remember her saying out loud, and I was little, but I remember her saying, what did I do wrong? What did I do wrong, you know? And I think about, my heart hurts for her thinking that because there is a lie out there that if you're a good parent or a good mom, your kids will turn out normal and good and make good choices, right? And sometimes as moms or dads, we tend to take that weight on ourselves like it's our fault. What did we do? And of course, none of us are the perfect parent. Only God is the perfect parent. But I just want to encourage you, if that's you this morning, you know, Adam and Eve were the first children, and they were in the garden, and they had the perfect environment, perfect circumstances, ample provision. They had the whole fruit of the garden except for the one tree that they weren't allowed to eat of, and they still went sideways. So if perfect parenting equals perfect children, 
God would have done it right there in the garden. But the problem is he gave us free choice. And he did that because he didn't want little robots to have to love him. If I have a little robot that says, I love you, I love you, I love you, it's not quite the same as my child coming to me saying, I choose. Like when my kids call me, I love, like yesterday my son and his wife called and they're like, hey, let's hang out. And I had to work on this sermon and I hadn't worked on it yet, but I can't say no to my kids because I love to spend time with them. And so I did and um, started working on this last night. (laughs) But anyways, I was thinking this morning, you know, Mother's Day, for most of the people that I know, is a painful day. If you are out there and you had a healthy mom who loved you, you are among the few select and be ever so grateful. I'm one of those people. My mom, she was not perfect, but she was a good, steady, stable mom. Many, many people did not have that. There's many in a room this size. There's many of you, I was thinking, like, just in my little circle of life, I have multiple friends, multiple, who have lost kids due to overdose, due to suicide, murder, car accidents. Just in my little circle, I have personal friends that have lost children. And the ache of the heart for that, I can't even imagine. I have friends who couldn't have kids, which is a whole ache in itself, and then adopted And then those adopted kids really went sideways and are in very dark places. I have um, friends who aborted kids, many friends who chose abortion when they panicked and didn't think they could handle children. And now they live with shame and regret. And we know that Jesus forgives and that those little babies are up with him. But those friends of mine, those, if that's you, God forgives you, but you live with an ache in your heart when Mother's Day comes, right? I have friends who have kids in jail who are chronically ill. I have single mom friends who are struggling financially to put food on the table and to emotionally be able to be present for their kids because they're working two jobs. I have more than one friend who's lost custody of their kids due to their own addictions and whose hearts are aching and want their kids back. There's miscarriage, there's um, multiple people in this room who have lost their moms. I lost one of my best friends January 1st and her two young daughters are without their mom today and I know many people have lost their moms. There's adult kids here in this room whose your mother wasn't able to be there for you. Like not only was she not nurturing and loving and supportive, she actually damaged you emotionally, physically, spiritually, mentally. And here we are this morning saying, God, would you show up? Would you comfort our hearts? So just thinking about all of this and thinking, I don't want to deliver a leave it to beaver message this morning where it's the perfect little family and, oh, the struggle and the fatigue of being a mom. That's all true. But I start thinking like, Lord, how? How do you carry the weight of being a mom or of having a mom that wasn't there for you? How do we move forward as powerful women? And if you're not a mom and you're a man this morning, everything I'm going to teach you in God's word this morning um, applies to men and women. It's about the love of God. I'm going to t- we're going to talk about the love of God in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. And I think Joe or Chris taught on this somewhat recently. Was it you, Chris? Maybe. Yeah. And, but I felt like I'm supposed to teach it. And I know that the love of God is something that we need to hear over and over and over again. When I talk about the love of God, it's kind of like, you know when you skip a rock and you feel like it skips across the top of the water? That's how I feel when I throw out the love of God. I feel like we don't really get it. It doesn't really sink in that the creator of the heavens and the earth, the one who formed the stars in the sky and has flaming balls of fire shooting a thousand miles off the sun who put us just close enough that we don't fry and just far enough that we don't freeze. That God is crazy about you. He is extremely devoted to you and he will spare nothing to reach your heart. He is the God who leaves the 99 to go after the one and that's you and me. 
And that's the God we're going to look at, his love this morning, because I believe that until you re- receive and understand and grab hold of that love for you, you can't give that out. And if you want to be a better mom, and if you want to have a better relationship with your mom, that's where it starts. You have three relationships in life. You have a relationship with God, you have a relationship with yourself, and you have a relationship with others. And only in a place where you're rooted and grounded in the love of God can all those start to shift into a healthy place. So we're going um, to look at 1 Corinthians 13 this morning. I also wanted to just mention that just because you're a good parent or blessed by God doesn't mean that it's going to be easy for you and that you won't suffer or watch your kids suffer. I think of Mary, you know, Jesus' mother. And when the angel came to her, he said, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb, Jesus. He, uh, the angel said, He will be great, and he will be called the Son of the Most High, and his kingdom will have no end. That's in Luke chapter 2. So Mary gets this proclamation that she's the most blessed woman ever, and that her son is going to have a kingdom that has no end. And yet we all know that Mary stood from a little distance and watched Jesus be spit upon and have a thorn, thorns shoved into his head and beaten and whipped and nailed to a cross. I can't, I can't even imagine, honestly, I really can't imagine uh, watching one of my children go through that. And yet she was blessed in God's eyes. So just because your circumstances are difficult and you might be watching your kids suffer doesn't mean that you're not blessed and chosen. Your life is made up of many chapters, and you are in a specific chapter right now, but it's not the end. Amen. That's right. We win in the end. That's right. You know, Jesus on the cross, it didn't look like he won. And for three days, the enemy rejoiced that he had beaten and killed the Son of God until that resurrection day. So it's not as it looks. If, things are, if you're in a dark chapter right now, that's not the end. We win in the end, right? Um, I started thinking, okay, maybe I could pick a mother to teach on. I've, this is my third Mother's Day teaching here, and I was like, eh, I spoke on Sarah and Elizabeth and Hagar and um, Samuel's mom, what's her name, Hannah, and anyways, I was like, I'm kind of out of mothers. What am I going to teach on? <laughs> so then I started looking at the mothers in the Bible. And you know what? The Bible is amazing. It's so real. I love our little plaque out there in the foyer. It says, we do real. If you take off your little religious cap and actually meditate in the word of God, the Bible does real. God is not ashamed to show the faults of his heroes. These heroes in the Bible also had failures, and that is to encourage us that no matter where you are, no matter what you've done today, there is hope for you that God can use you, and he loves you. I looked at the Bible, and I started thinking of the heartache of all the women that I know, and I I first went to the very first mother, Eve. The very first mother watched her one son murder her other son. So you could just read that real quick like that, or you can stop and think about the heartache involved there. Not only was her son murdered in the very first generation, but then she had to deal with this other son who had murdered her son. So right away, we find real hard life in the Bible. I think of all the, um, the mothers or the people, the heroes in the Bible who lost their mothers. Joseph and Benjamin lost Rachel. And Joseph is my favorite Bible character of all the Bible characters. That guy is a rock star. He went through it. And he lost his mom. And then he lost his dad, too. He has got sold into slavery. Um, and then Benjamin, his brother, Rachel died giving birth to him. So him growing up knowing, oh, mom died from me. Like there's so much ways the enemy can come in with lies when circumstances happen, right? That's why it's so important to know the truth. Esther was a total um, orphan. 
She lost both of her parents, and that's why Mordecai was raising her. Moses' mom had to put him in a basket and send him down the river because he was going to die otherwise. And Samuel's mom gave him to the priesthood to become a little priest. But the ache in the heart of the loss for Samuel, he, I'm sure he wanted to be with his mom rather than Eli. <laughs> right? If you know anything about Eli, I wouldn't want to be raised by Eli. Um, <laughs> and then there's lots of, lots of children that uh, mothers in the Bible who lost children, Bathsheba, uh, Mary, watch Joseph die, Naomi in the Bible. Both of her sons and her husband died. You could just read over that really fast. But think about like if it were your friend. Think of a friend of yours and if they lost their only two children and their husband. It's no wonder she said, don't call me Naomi anymore. Naomi means pleasant. She said, call me Mara, which means bitter because she was in pain. And then we have Hagar, who abandoned Ishmael when they ran out of water. She just put him in a bush and walked away and let him cry until the angel appeared and showed her the water. So we have all sorts of mothers. We have Jacob's um, and Esau's mom, um, Rebecca, who taught Jacob how to lie. She said, go put on your brother's clothes. We're going to put some fur on your hands. Pretend you're your brother so you can get the spiritual blessing. Ah, right? And God had told her, the older will serve the younger. So God had told her that Jacob was going to be the one who was the most powerful, but she felt like she needed to have him lie to manipulate that into being, because I guess God of the universe wasn't quite big enough to make that happen without her going and having her child lie. And then when Isaac says, you sound like Jacob, is it, is it really Esau? He says, uh, and he goes, how did you get the, the deer or whatever you killed for, to cook me the meal that I wanted? How did you get that so fastly? He's like, oh, the Lord your God gave it to me. And he totally spiritualizes the lie. So anyhow, we have, we have all sorts of mothers in the Bible who have been through all sorts of stuff. It's full of very real stuff. Um, so the problem is with all of these many situations of all these heartaches this morning is how do we comfort all these different situations? How do we receive the healing of God and move forward? Because your past does not determine your future. Amen. But you have a choice to own you today. I have my own story. I have my own pain. And you have your own. They look very different, most likely. But nobody gets spared the suffering card. And you can choose to step into your healing but you have to choose to let him near your heart. And some of us, because of the extreme heartache and disappointment and pain, we're holding God over here. Just not sure I want to let you close because you could have prevented this. You could have stopped this. And this morning, the Lord is inviting you to put a stake in the ground, to make a fresh start, to say, Lord, I want you to heal that. I know you didn't cause that. I want you to heal that. And I'm not going to let what I don't understand about you get in the way of what I do understand about you. And whenever I'm wondering, God, why did you let this or that happen? Lord, I was serving you. How did you let this happen in my life? I always have to go back to the cross. Because the cross is the love of God poured out right before us. There's no wavering there that God loves us and pursued us. So the problem of the human being race, whether you're a mother or not, is that we crave love. We want acceptance. We want to know and be known. And we want an unconditional love that is not based on if you're pretty enough, if you're smart enough, if you make enough money. Because that involves fear. That conditional love involves fear. Because what if I lose my beauty? What if I go bankrupt? Are you still going to love me? What if I'm not... What if I have an accident and I become disabled Are you st and I can't go bike riding with you? Are you still going to love me? Dumb example, but you get it. Um, so we need a love that is not faltering, that is all in, all committed. And unfortunately, there's like a myth out there that, oh, that's, some, that's that mother's love. Well, I'll tell you, I'm a mother and I couldn't love my kids anymore, but I failed many times. And my mom, she was great, but she failed many times. And so a mother's love isn't enough to fill that void in our heart. And 
So the problem is that we start to look for love on a horizontal level from people, from our moms, from our children, from our spouses. I'm kind of silly if you haven't noticed, and I thought this would be fun. I don't know if it's gonna work, but this is what we do. Can you hear this? Sing it, church. Right? That's what we do. I don't know if you could hear that, but I think it was funny. We go looking for love in all the wrong places. We look for love from our mothers and she fails us. We look for our spouses and we kill the relationships because we're so hungry for love and we're looking for it horizontally when it can only come vertically from the Father. There is no greater need in each human heart than to be loved with an unacceptable love. Um, We look for love horizontally and we get hurt, we get disappointed, and then we end up harming our relationships because we're too needy in those relationships. The best thing that you can do to improve all of your relationships, not just with your mother or as a mother, but the best thing that you can do is to plant yourself and root yourself in the love of God. When you realize that you are perfectly loved, totally forgiven, that will spill into all your relationships. That's why Jesus um, said about the woman who was, you know, who came and she was washing his feet with her tears, and they're all, why are you letting her do that, the religious leaders? And he's like, she's been forgiven much, and so she loves much. And when you realize that each and every sin, all the things that you'd be embarrassed if we all knew about right here, because we all have those things, those things Jesus died for, and that that love he has for you is unshakable, then you're carrying like a little heart that's full of love. And when somebody bumps you because they bump you, they bump me on the freeway all the time, (laughs) love spills out because that's what your heart is full of. I remember one of the times where I was the lowest, like I was in ministry, we were the young married pastors and, um, and I had just behaved horribly and it was the next day and I was on my face before God and I was like, I know better. I should not have sinned that way. I just don't think that you could love me anymore. And the Lord came and I won't go into the details because I have many times from up here, but he showed me, no, there's no final straw to break the camel's back. There's no, that's it. I'm done. There's no surprise. God is not surprised when you sin. You might be surprised. Peter was surprised. Peter, Jesus said, Peter, Satan has asked to sift you like wheat, but I've prayed for you that your faith won't fail. And he's like, oh, Lord, I'm so committed to you. I would die for you. And Jesus says, really? (laughs) He says, by the time the rooster crows, you're going to deny me three times. And that's, of course, what happened. But Peter was shocked by his own sin. But Jesus knew it before it happened. And he said to Peter, when you turn back, go feed my sheep. So he was calling him into ministry, knowing he was going to fully deny him. That is the kind of love that God has for you. He already knows the sins you're going to do today and tomorrow and for the rest of your life, and he loves you, and he's called you, and he wants to use you. In your weakness, he wants to be strong. And what Satan has come in your individual life, and the way he has ravaged your life, Jesus wants to come, and as you surrender your heart to him, moment by moment, day by day, it's not a waving of a magic wand, but as you wake up every day and say, Lord, I'm yours, can't do this, need you, fill me right now, he redeems it. He not only heals you, of the ache and the disappointment, but he causes you to go out as a mighty warrior and to wreak havoc on the kingdom of darkness because you get an authority over those areas that you've been damaged in and violated. When you get healed up, you're not only healed up, but now you can go and fight for the others who need that healing. You carry a new authority in that area to fight and bring light into darkness. Um, You know, The reason I really want to, we're going to get into the text right now. The reason why I wanted to really focus on this this morning is because um, in 2 Corinthians 3.18, do we have that? Did I? I'm not sure if I gave that to, yeah. 
But we all with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as from the Lord the Spirit. So whatever you behold, whatever you gaze upon, whatever you put your focus on, you become. You want to focus on the pain and the bitterness and the hurt of the past? That's going to grow in you. And I'm not saying that you deny it and you pretend it's not there, but what you want to focus on is the glory of the Lord. The glory of the Lord is his, his goodness, his kindness, his mercy, who he is. And as you behold him, it's, we see it dimly now. The mirrors back then when this was written, they weren't like our mirrors where we can see perfectly. They weren't uh, crystal clear. And he was saying, you know, when we look at the Lord right now, we don't see him perfectly. But still, as we behold him, we go from glory to glory. He transforms us, and we become more like him every day. Um, so we're going to talk about love this morning. We're going to dive right in. Um, in 1 John 4, I'm going to go there really quickly. In 1 John 4, 16 through 19, Because we have lots of problems with um, words and, and the language in this text. Because I say, like, oh, I love my children. And what I mean by that is, like, I'll take a bullet for them, right? I'll dive in front of a bus for them. But I also say, I love my chocolate, especially my dark chocolate with sea salt and caramel. But it's two different kinds of love, right? Right? And so we get, we get um, confused about that. And then we hear, like, people will say, oh, I love, I don't know, Jason Momoa, or I love, you know, whatever. <laughs> right? They mean that in an infatuation way, like, oh, you know. So there's, like, all different feelings and meanings behind this one word that we say, love. Um, so we're going to look at what the Bible meant when it's talking about love. And we're in 1 John 4, 16 through 19. Cool. We have come to know and have believed the love which God has for us. God is love, and the one who abides in love abides in God, and God abides in him. By this, love is perfected with us, so that we may have confidence in the day of judgment, because he, as he is, so also are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear because fear involves punishment and the one who fears is not perfected in love. We love because he first loved us. So I just want to point out that we love because he loved us first. Sometimes it's funny how Peter like said, oh no, Lord, I would die for you. Like we think that we're more committed to God than he is to us. Al contrar, like 100%. We were doing our own thing, and he left the 99, and he came after you. And if you look at your life, he's the hound of heaven. He's been pursuing you, pursuing you, pursuing you. Some of us are more stubborn than others, but he is the one who pursues you. He loved you first. And once you receive that love, then we love back. And it says in verse 16 that God is love. So you want to know what God is, what he's like, he is love. And I want to remind you that in John chapter 1, it says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And nothing was made without him in the world, and the Word became flesh, and it dwelt among us. And in him we beheld the glory, the only glory of the Father, full of grace and truth. So if you want to know what God's like, Look at Jesus. He literally is God in skin. He put on, as Joe calls it, a man suit or a human suit. I can't remember. A what? Earth suit. earth suit. Yes. He put on an earth suit. So if you want to know what God's heart is like, get in the word of God. Jesus said you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. Amen. What truth will set you free? The truth that you know. If you don't know it, it can't set you free right? I could have keys to my car, but not know where they are or not know that they're right in the bottom of my purse and I can't get in. You have to know the truth in order for the truth to be able to set you free. There's my little plug for you to get in the word of God. I remember my friend who, she got saved many years ago and she was sitting at a table 
with a girl that was witnessing to her, and she had just had her heart broken in a relationship. And um, the girl said to her, I know a man who will never let you down. And she's like, who? Who is this man? (laughs) She's like, it's Jesus. It's Jesus. He's the only one who ever walked the earth who will never let you down, and not another. No matter, even Pastor Joe, Pastor Chris, we're just humans. They're going to hurt you, disappoint you, let you down. That's why our hope has to be in God only. Um, so what is love? It's not a feeling that comes and goes. It's a commitment, an unwavering commitment to the well-being of another. And uh, we're going to get in our text right now in 1 Corinthians twelve thirty-one. So... Just a little bit of information for you here. In, in the 13th century is when they made the Bible into chapters. Before that, it was all just a book, like the book of Corinthians. And then in the 13th century, they went and they added chapters. And then in the 16th century, they divided it into verses. So sometimes I think they didn't quite divide things right, just in my humble opinion. Um, And so I think verse 31 in chapter 12 really should have been part of chapter 13 because it is a beautiful um, entryway for it. So we're going to read that first. And just a little context, in 1 Corinthians 12, it's talking all about the spiritual gifts. And, And it explains all the different gifts and how God gives them to different people in the body and how... The church is the whole body of Christ, and we need each different gift, and we're to honor each other with our gifts and um, to eagerly desire them. Um, But then he says in chapter 31, earnestly desire the greater gifts. So we are to earnestly desire spiritual gifts. That's a good thing. Like, I want all the gifts that God wants to give me so that I can encourage you in every way he has intended for me to encourage you. Do you know that God has not made you a wallflower? Each one of you has different gifts and you have different callings on your life and as you surrender your heart to him, you step into that calling more and more and more. And so he's saying here, it's a good thing to desire the gifts of God. It's not a selfish thing. I'm like, Lord, bring it on. Give me the gift of knowledge, wisdom, teaching, prophecy. Like I want it all so that I can be the most powerful in this short little time I have on planet earth. But the next verse says, And I will show you a still more excellent way. So even though gifts are powerful for the building up of the body of Christ and for evangelism, there is yet a more excellent way. And then I want to jump over to 1 Corinthians 14, verse 1. It says, pursue love, yet desire earnestly the spiritual gifts. So... What Paul is telling us in 12.31 and 14.1 is that we're to earnestly desire spiritual gifts, but we are to pursue love. And pursue means to run swiftly in order to catch something, to seek eagerly, to run after with a focus. I happen to love the princess bride. Some of my sisters think I'm so silly, but do any lovers of princess bride? Yes. Do you remember in Indigo Montoya? My name is Indigo Montoya. You killed my father. Prepare to die. Right? (laughs) Um, I'm such a dork. I know it. The good thing about when you know you're a sinner and that God still loves you is you could be a dork because it doesn't matter. Right? We just get to be ourselves. I was laughing because somebody said to me, you know, my whole life I've been taught to take masks off and now the church is telling me to put a mask on. But we get to be ourselves here, right? Indigo Montoya, that guy throughout the whole movie just had this focus everywhere he went. Like he's in the middle of the sword fight and he's like, do you happen to have six fingers? (laughs) Because he's looking for the guy who killed his father and his goal is to avenge his father's death. And we are to pursue love. Just like, that was his goal. I was um, getting my nails done yesterday and there was a football game on the screen and I like to play football, but I don't like to watch it as much. Um, But I was watching all these crazy fans scream and jump and, you know, and I was like, what's the goal here? To get the ball across that line, right? That's the goal of football. And I was like, what's the goal for you and me on this earth? It's to love God with all your heart, love your neighbor as you love yourself. 
That's the goal of your life here. All the other little goals, get a house, get a nice car, find a spouse, have some kids, be happy, those are all side goals. The goal of this game here on planet Earth, which it isn't a game, is to learn to love. So we're gonna dive into the text since I, it's almost done with my message, uh, time-wise. <laughs> um, verse 13, if I speak with the tongue of men, chapter 13, verse one, if I speak with the tongue of men and angels, but do not have love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. So if I have the gift of speaking in tongues, um, but I don't have love, the motivation of love, loving God, loving others, loving myself, not only does it not help anybody, it's annoying. Does anybody like clanging cymbals? It's annoying. It's like you want to run out of the room, right? When the guy's going down the band. <laughs> um, verse 2, if I have the gift of prophecy and know all mysteries and knowledge, if I have faith so as I can remove mountains but do not have love, I am nothing. So you could be a powerful person full of so much faith. And literally, it doesn't mean to remove mountains. That was a, a Jewish um, proverb, that, like it, what it referred to as doing the impossible. So if you have so much faith that you could do the impossible, but you don't have love, literally, in God's eyes, it's nothing. And if I give all my possessions to feed the poor and I surrender my body to be burned, but I don't have love, it profits me nothing. That's so easy to read over really quickly, but think about it. If I go and sell my house, that's a big deal. Put my house on the market, get the money, sell my car, so now I have no car, sell all my clothes, all my furniture, all my kitchen stuff, and give all of that money to the poor. Don't save anything for myself, but I don't have love. It won't profit me one little iota in heaven. The motivation of the heart of love is what God looks at. That's why God said when he was choosing David, he said to Samuel, man looks on the outside, I look at the heart. And God's looking for love. Um, verse 4. Okay, so here we, we talked about God is love, remember? Do you remember in math? Well, I probably shouldn't do this, but I like math. A equals B, and if B equals C then A equals C. Do you remember that? So if A equals B, but B also equals C, then A must be the same as C. So God is love, and love is all this that we're going to read. So we can put God's name in every time we see the word love right there. And I want to do a real quick just side note on this love, this word for love is agape. So God is agape. And there's three different kinds of loves. Actually, I think there's four in Aramaic, but the main three popular ones was eros, which was a sensual love, a fleshly love. Um, phileo, which was an emotional friendship, you know, caring about, affectionate type love. And then there was agape. And some people have taught that agape is the unconditional love of God. That's really not 100% true because like in John 3.16, it says, For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son. That's God so agape the world that he gave his only begotten son. But right down two verses after that, it says, Men loved the darkness. It says men agape the darkness. So it's not necessarily a divine love. It's 100% given over themselves to. So that's what kind of love agape is. It holds nothing back. It's that unconditional love, 100% committed to the well-being of another regardless of what you get back. And that's the kind of love um, that God has for us. So now we're going to get into it. Love is patient. And what that literally means is love suffers long and is kind. Do you know that with you God suffers long? He's not like that termite guy with the hammer behind his back, you know, on the commercial with the little insect. What is it? I don't know. Where he, anyhow, he's waiting to smash the thing. That's not God. That's not God. He is slow to anger and quick to forgive. He is patient. And he is kind. When I think of kindness of like how Jesus treated the woman who was caught in adultery, 
Like he's like, where are your accusers? Neither, I, neither do I condemn you. He treated her with such kindness. And love is not jealous. When you're jealous for something, it's because you feel like you don't have enough. And so you need something else to make you more complete. God is so full. The love he has, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, that love, he's not jealous. He needs nothing. He is jealous for your heart because he loves you so much that he knows that only as you are abiding in him will you find life abundantly. That's his jealousy for you, not because he needs you to fill some part of his heart. His jealousy even over you is because he desires you to have a full life. So he's not jealous. God does not brag and is not arrogant. I think about how Jesus entered the world. He came as a little baby out. They couldn't even find a room for him to be born in. Out with the animals, you know, the cows mooing and the sheep baying, like stink all around. That's how he chose to make his appearance on the earth. He doesn't parade himself. Um, he doesn't act unbecomingly. I think some of us are afraid, like, oh, if I give my heart fully to God, he's going to make me do something weird or act strange. He's not like that. He doesn't act unbecomingly. He's not weird. It doesn't seek its own. God doesn't seek his own. He's after your good. He is not provoked. Some of your versions say it's not easily provoked. That easily is not in the text. I think some translators <laughs> couldn't fathom that it's not provoked at all. But God's love is not provoked. He is patient and he is kind. He doesn't take into account a wrong suffered. That word is like a accounting word, like a, you know, when you keep a, um, what's the word? Ledger, thank you. Like a ledger, a tally of wrongs. God's not like that. He's not like when you sin, like let's say, <clears throat> I don't know, you looked at something you shouldn't have looked at or you lied to someone. He doesn't go, now that is the 45th time this month that you've done that. He doesn't have a ledger. That's why Jesus died for you. He says that your slate is wiped clean. That's why the gospel is good news. Whatever you've done, the darkest places of your heart does not shock God. He paid for it on the cross. He doesn't delight in holding your sins up and airing your dirty laundry for everyone to see. He does not rejoice in unrighteousness, but he rejoices in the truth. Sometimes we get like, ha, that guy finally got what he deserved. You know, or she finally got exposed, you know. God's not like that. God rejoices when you walk in the truth. He rejoices when justice prevails. So you can put God's name in here everywhere it says love. God is patient. God is kind. God is not jealous. God does not brag. And God is not arrogant. God does not act unbecomingly. He does not seek his own. He's not provoked. He doesn't take into account a wrong suffered. He doesn't rejoice in unrighteousness. He rejoices in the truth. We're we'll finished up here. He bears all things. What that means is it's like an, like an, an, a love that's not exhaustible. He bears it. He carries it. Uh, there's a verse that I love. It says, um, I think it's in Proverbs. Uh, love covers a multitude of sins. And that's the bearing all things that God does for us. And you know what? When you receive that mercy in your own life, you, it's easier to forgive others. Some people go, how can I forgive this person in my own family raped me or violated me? How can I forgive this person who took my child's life? And I have no answer except for look at the cross and look at what Jesus forgave you. And as you soak in that kindness and that forgiveness, your heart will start to shift to the point where you are able to forgive and you actually will get to a place where you can bless those who harmed you. And that's how you know when you've started to enter in healing. Um, so love bears all things, it believes all things. It means it believes the best. Believes the best. And you know, God who began the good work in you, he's gonna be faithful to complete it. 
He's just looking for you to take an inch of a step his way so that he can partner with you and start to move more powerfully in you. And he hopes all things. God's love endures all things. Love never fails. God never fails. If there's gifts of prophecy, they will be done away with. If there's tongues, they will cease. If there's knowledge, they will be done away. For we know now in part, and we prophesy in part. But when the perfect comes, the partial will be done away. That doesn't mean, some people think that means, oh, when the New Testament came, all these gifts went away. That's not what it's talking about here. Um, It's talking about when we see him face to face. And we don't need all these gifts to encourage each other and build each other up and try and keep each other on the straight and narrow because we're going to be face to face. and We're going to be like him. And we're not going to struggle with sin anymore. You know, your days of having to struggle and fight sin, they're numbered. Like, everybody's like, oh, I don't want to have another birthday. I don't want to get another year old. I'm like, I'm a year closer to glory. I, I am looking forward to heaven. Like, I love my children. I love my family. But I, every day, I'm just more and more in love with Jesus, and I'm ready. So if I die, have a party. Um, <laughs> When I was a child, I used to speak like a child, think like a child, reason like a child, and I became a man. I did away with child things. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. There's going to come a day when each one of us will stand face to face with Jesus, and we will see him exactly the way he is. Now I know in part, but then I will know fully, just as I have been fully known. But now faith, hope, and love abide, these three, but the greatest of these is love. You know, there is, God made us in his likeness, male and female, he created us, right? It says God made men, uh, God made mankind in his image, male and female, he created them. And there is a female part of the heart of God. It's, a, it's what Chris was talking about up here. I'm not talking about the gender of God. I'm talking about God made man and woman, and each of them bear his image in different ways. And um, there is a lot of talk about the father wound when, when you have a father who didn't love you like God. Sometimes it's hard to receive God's father love. And I think it's the same with the mother's heart. When you didn't receive that nurturing or your mother just criticized you and spoke negatively over you, you'll never amount to nothing, or she abandoned you, or she was an addict, or she wasn't able to be there, we can have damage in our hearts to receive that part of God. I had a little, I'm going to finish right now, I had a little birdie in my backyard. Oh my gosh, it was like so cute. It's on my Facebook page if you want to see it. I sat in the backyard and watched this little bird. It couldn't fly only like a foot and a half in the air, and it was trying so hard. It was lifting up and coming down, and the mother bird kept coming down and going, like talking to it and then flying back up in the tree. And I just sat there for like an hour watching it, and um, finally it flew across the backyard and landed on my tennis shoe. So I put the picture on Facebook. It's so cute. But anyhow, I'm like filming myself, like filming it on my foot, and I'm talking to it going, you got this little guy. You're going to make it. The cat's not going to get you. You're going to be safe. (laughs) And I was thinking, that's the heart of God. That's the mother side of the heart of God that says, I got you. You have to step into this. Like the mother, she couldn't. She was little herself. She couldn't bear that baby up. He was out of the nest. She couldn't bear him up and take him back up in the tree. But she kept coming down. and Literally, it was the cutest thing. And then the birds got me going, you got this. Like I'm like, we're cheerleading for that baby bird to come into all that it was supposed to be. But that baby bird was at a place where it had to choose to fly its wings. And I was so proud of it. It kept doing these little do-do-do all around the yard. And I know, I believe, that it didn't get eaten by a cat, I hope. Um, I, I believe it was, it was doing its thing. And I heard that it takes two or three days for their wings to get strong enough for them to actually fly. But some of you this morning, you're at that place. And God is saying, let me encourage you. Come my way. Let me love you. As Chris said, forgive your mother. Forgive yourself if you've been a mother that's less than what you hoped you'd be. And today, step into that place 
where I can start to heal your heart and where you can come and start stepping forward in the calling of God on your life. Um, when they were praying for me before, um, Brian had a word of um, JL. And she's the woman in the Old Testament when the enemy came in the middle of the war. He came and he took a nap in her tent. And she took the tent peg and she hammered it in his temple. And she took the enemy out of their life. And he had a word that today, women and men, we have to take that tent peg and we got to hammer the enemy, say, enough. I'm not going to wallow in what's happened in the past. I'm going to get healing. I'm going to move forward. I am going to be a mother to the younger ones around me, and I'm going to find godly women to be a mother to me. So I want to close us out in prayer. If you want a special, like this morning your heart's going, yes, 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 I need that, I want you to stand up right now. I know there's some of you here who need that. Don't be shy. There's got to be like half of you, I would think. In this kind of world we live in. There we go. So I'm just going to lead you in a prayer. And then I just pray you have an amazing Mother's Day. And that you know how absolutely loved you are. There's nothing that you could do that would cause the Father to say, enough, no more. And that you can start living and breathing and laughing again in the presence of God. So let's close in prayer. So if you're standing up, just repeat after me. Dear Lord. I'm asking you to touch me today and to heal my broken heart. I pray you'd go to those deep places and heal me. Pray you'd give me vision for what my life is to be and that you'd help me day by day to say yes to you. Fill me, Holy Spirit, with your power. Help me to forgive myself and anyone who's hurt me. I love you, Lord. I thank you that you're hearing me right now and moving on my behalf. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. God bless you.